welcome to episode 277 of the Postal Hub podcast. I'm Ian Kerr. 20 years after the dot-com bubble, should we be preparing for a log-com bubble? Rule gay fathers. Professor in last mile logistics and supply chain at the University of Antwerp shares his perspective on the money pouring into last mile startups and the possibility that it's all going to fall in a terrible heap. The future of dark stores might not be so bright. We also talk about some of the labour issues still facing the Belgian e commerce delivery sector. Joining me on the line is Rul Kevars. He's a professor in last mile logistics and supply chain at the University of Antwerp. Welcome back, Rul. We're, we're going to talk about a couple of topics today, and one of which we did discuss earlier in the year, and there's been some developments. We'll get to that in a moment. First of all, you recently wrote an article in the media, an article in the media, talking about the ultra-fast delivery phenomenon, some of the pressures that it's under, and it's likely... Uh, survival. <laughs> Let's put it this. Well, actually, you used a really good phrase. You talked about the a bubble. So twenty, just over twenty years ago, we had the dot com bubble, which burst. Should we be preparing for a log com bubble, the logistics companies bubble? What are we really talking about here, Rule? What what kind of companies do you think are in a bubble? Uh, well, what you see indeed is that in last couple of years, you saw a lot of developments in uh, last mile logistics, etc., and, and especially in companies which combine an IT component with a logistics component. And one of those typical examples where you saw, especially the last two, three years, a real increase in the number of players and the invested money in that sector is, of course, the quick commerce like the Gorillas, the Getias, the, the Cajus, etc. And uh, what was so typical about them is that as long as there is cheap money, like on, on the stock exchange and in private equity firms, they collected last couple of years, if you check 2020, 2021, they in billions and billions of US dollars and euros were invested in these companies. But what you see today is that they um, those companies rely on two main things is buying aggressively market power or market share in some markets. Like uh, if you saw the investment money for just starting in a city, they invested huge amounts of money. So huge costs financed by very cheap uh, money. I mean, for almost no interest rate, just cheap money. They went to the, onto the, the market asking for money. They get hundreds of millions. But in the end, what you see now is that... Um, Interest rates are increasing a bit. Uncertainty on financial markets is increasing. So companies are reducing their investments in that kind of companies. And what you now see is that their costs uh, are way too high. Their revenues are very slow. And now you see a bit like that uh, many of those companies are in becoming in problems, like they don't find any financing anymore. They need to shut down certain areas. So our opinion was that a lot of these, especially quick commerce companies and, and uh, last mile companies, which make a clear link between IT and last mile deliveries, they were having so much money for free buying aggressively market power, but now they see that their real business model in the end of earning the money what, with what they do was not stable enough. And then you see, of course, for example, Gorillas closed down in Belgium. You see in a lot of other co- uh, countries that they do the same. Companies like Cajou and uh, Getty are having a bit the same problems everywhere. So there really is a big problem between cheap money on the markets and having built a kind of business model which is on the long term not sustainable. And as long as there is cheap money, it works. But once the cheap money is gone, you see that in a lot of areas it's blocking. And indeed, we are afraid that there might be a, what you call a log com bubble 20 years after, do, after the dot, uh, dot com bubble. Well, I, I think there are certain echoes. I'm speaking of somebody who lived through that <laughs> dot com bubble, and there was silly money washing around at the time. Yeah. And there was a lot of money being pumped into advertising. I mean, anybody who remembers being, say, on the London Tube back in the year 2000, you were seeing advertising plastered all over the Tube for for some of these websites that uh, were popping up at the time. And there's certainly other echoes of that today when you think about the advertising and the money that's being pumped into customer acquisition when it comes to these these this flash delivery, ultra-fast delivery, whatever you'd like to call it. Um, one of the 
pain points we've also seen over the last few months has been dark stores. So, um, Rule, can you just explain what dark stores are and some of those so pressures that are being brought to bear on dark stores and sourcing the real estate and things like that? Well, um, indeed, if you look to so, uh, companies like uh, Quick Commerce, uh, they promise in most cases that uh, consumers are delivered with products, uh, mainly with, with uh, food products, within 10 minutes. Well, of course, that means by definition that if you are in a city, you need a lot of small warehouses or even small shops from where you can do the shipments if you only have 10 minutes. And what is typically there is that while a normal traditional e-commerce uh, player has in most cases like one central warehouse for a whole region, they need to have many of those small dark stores. That means they look inside like a kind of a store, but without customers. It's only for order picking. Um, but as you see there, if you want to supply a city like London or Amsterdam, you need to have several of those dark stores within your city to be able to cover your whole, whole city area within 10 minutes. And uh, one example there is for uh, that uh, the city of Amsterdam, uh, they saw last couple of years and months so many dark stores popping up everywhere in the street, a bit pushing out sometimes traditional retail, which made that the nice shopping streets sometimes were having those shops where you just had a foil after the window or where you saw something is happening there, but it looks a bit dodgy or strange. Might be a, a dark store. So the, the city of Amsterdam decided uh, almost a month ago that uh, they wanted to reduce the number of dark stores. And for example, for asking a new permission for opening a dark store, it had to go outside more to the city borders, more again to the idea of urban consolidation centers of uh, some years ago. But again, there that was uh, that was limiting the options for a lot of these uh, quick commerce players because the, the biking times were, beca- uh, were becoming much higher. Uh, and so their business model also from a legislation point of view, from a real estate point of view, was getting under pressure. O- uh, other cities were also looking into that kind of measures. And when it comes to these dark stores and their operations, you've just mentioned that there's, there's the the area that they serve, that footprint. I think they've worked out, somebody worked out, there was a, the uh, optimum radius that they served was like two and a half kilometres or four kilometres, something like that. So it's not a very big number. Nope. So there has to have a very dense network of them. Um, but inside the up operations inside those dark stores, mm-hmm. how, we went, how does it actually work when it comes to the rider picking orders and things like that and the times and stuff? How does the economics of all that work out? Well, uh, if you uh, place an order with a, a quick commerce player, in most cases, like uh, like I say, they uh, promise to deliver you within 10 to 15 minutes. So the, the uh, main operations are done where you have a rider or a biker or a courier, like you call it, he gets on a smartphone the orders he needs to pick. So it's the normally the biker that picks the goods from that dark store. He puts them in a bag uh, or in his backpack, and then he drives straight to you. Uh, no, normally, so it's e- even express deliveries almost, a bit like the, the old pizza style where they deliver the pizza straight to your door. But of course, what is interesting there, and especially also in a, a country as Belgium, uh, due to some issues last couple of months and years in um, with social legislation, uh, a lot of those pre-commerce players decided to work with payroll people. So that means you put really the, the, the riders, the bikers on your payroll. But if you compare that, for example, if you look to, for example, Belgium, if you should take all costs into account, operational costs, picking costs, uh, social security, etc., a biker is uh, or a rider is easily costing 25 euros an hour. But if you think a bit, if you uh, analyze together with me, a good uh, courier can do, let's say, within one hour, six to seven deliveries, and then he needs to drive fast and, and he needs to do big, quick picking. But if you know 25 euros and you divide that, for example, by something like six or seven, the, the already the, the costs for the operational thing for the rider is already something like three to four euros, at least for uh, doing the delivery. But those quick commerce companies only ask sometimes 1.5 to 1.8 euro per delivery. That means that the, they already start with a loss which they need to compensate on the products they sell. But if you know that the average basket sometimes is only 10, 10, 15 euros, and you know that the margins in traditional retail are something like 2 to 5 euros, you know by definition that with the model, it's loss making anyway. So 
And of course, there the idea was let's buy as much as possible market share and lose money on that one. Once we have the stable market share base, we will in- start increase prices a bit uh, or we sell ourselves a bit the model that yeah, Uber was using uh, years ago. Eh? Ten years ago, they were really ch- much cheaper than traditional taxi companies. Today, in some areas, they are exactly the same prices because they su- first bought market share. But of course, now the money is uh, getting more expensive in the market. So the, the plans they had to buy the market share are, are now under pressure. And does that also explain why a couple of these fast delivery companies, like Gorillas is one, they're releasing their own yeah. um, their own lines of products. And could that be sort of an echo of what Amazon does? Amazon obviously has the Amazon Web Services, which provides X percentage of its of its <laughs> of its revenue and profitability, and that enables Amazon to do other things under cost. I, I'm quite used the right words. I think everybody knows what yep. I mean. You know, is that this, this, could that be the similar thinking there for for likes of the likes of Gorillas? If you've got your own retail brands, you're not having to pay other manufacturers, other 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 brands to you, know, you will be able to keep it all in house, and maybe do some sort of cross subs or not cross subsidization, but eat the margin out of one to feed the costs in another part of the business. Well, of course, what of course what they do, of course, is that some of them they hope to become a kind of an ecosystem like Amazon is doing. Eh? They hope to have like a customer base where if you're living in a city, if you're, for example, like a student or if you are 20, 25 years old and you're living in a city like London where you don't have much space, they hope that you would start buying every day or every two days with them and that you buy their products and that you share their data. And of course, they want to be a bit like the ecosystem, like an uh, Amazon or like an Apple. Once you are in there, they hope you stay there. And indeed, like you see, uh, some of them are really starting to to buy their own products. But why do they do that? Um, if you sell your own product, so with the brand of Gorillas or the brand of Getir, with your own product lines, that's known in retail business, the average margin on an own product is higher than if you're selling uh, a, a brand product. Of course, the, the margin are dri- different. But there is another interesting thing that... Um, most of you should know is that last couple of years a lot of retailers bought a share in uh, those quick commerce companies for example the dutch um, retail player uh, jumbo bought a, sh- uh, a share in uh, gorillas uh, carrefour bought a share in cashew etc etc so in many cases um, they also try to just buy products for their own under their own brand in most cases they buy it via the suppliers of the, the shareholders like a Jumbo or a Carrefour. But in the end, it's only small percentages um, creating an ecosystem with just offering some product lines on the long term. Uh, I would call it a bit more panic reactions than purely um, than, than purely where they were uh, basing their business model on. So the discussion uh, we had just recently with Professor John Colley from the Warwick Business School was about what's the end game for these fast delivery companies, what is what 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 is success for them? And that was that. What is your point? What was your point of view on this? Do you think that they're um, just hoping to be acquired, or do you think that they are aiming for that that magical market share to become the dominant player? I think it's more um, like typically, if you look to the, I always say, if you want the, the 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 truth to the future, look to from where the money is coming from. And in most cases, the money is coming from hedge funds, private equity, risk capital groups. By definition, if they invest, they want to sell these companies within a time frame from five to 10 years. And in economics, we always say, try to make the bride as nice as possible if you sell it to the husband. And that's, I mean, that's a bit um, how it's done with those companies. Eh? They are pumped up and they hope to have a client base in certain cities. They hope to have a data flow in which they can say to, for example, a retailer, like, for example, that customer always ordered that kind of products uh, is at home at these timings. So they hope to be a bit like, indeed, customer base data-driven and some IT applications and being maybe the last mile for some of these retail players. So in the end, my main opinion is that uh, they are mainly searching for um, acquisitions, so getting themselves, making themselves nice to sell them on the market for a high price, higher than the investments. 
of course, some might survive, some will survive, uh, but I think it will be only in huge, large cities and only one or two po uh, potentially will survive. And for example, cities as London, where you know by definition that people don't have uh, a real kitchen anymore, but only a small uh, kitchenette or where you have a lot of bachelors, etc., which don't want to cook every day or go to the markets uh, or go to the retail store. Some will survive, but in the end, the main market forces are just, in my opinion, make yourself nice and sell uh, sell yourself within some years. But money was quicker away than they hoped, and that's now a bit where uh, everybody is. I can guarantee you that with a lot of retailers that bought market shares in quick commerce, they are now a bit panicking, uh, saying like, we invested hundreds of millions. Maybe it's not worth the thing. Or well, the other interesting development we've seen with a couple of these companies is they've decided to step away from the ultra fast delivery and just do fast. So within thirty minutes or within an hour, and that certainly has you know the potential then to be able to batch orders and for a delivery driver to do more than one delivery in one hit. Which is basically when you think about, say, we mentioned Amazon before, uh, when Amazon had its Prime Now product, uh, their, their drivers weren't delivering just one order at a time. They were delivering multiple orders. So um, anyway, we could we might just pivot though, which is another classic startup phrase. We'll pivot to a different uh, topic um, rule, which we discussed earlier this year, which was relating to labour laws in Belgium. Now, that sounds like a very dry topic, mm -hmm. but there are some labour laws in Belgium which have had a direct impact on e-commerce, e-commerce delivery and logistics, warehouse operations, but there's been some movement. So, Rule, can you just share a little bit about what's been happening there? Well, already for years in Belgium, we had a rather strict legislation or especially the flexibility on the night labor work uh, for e-commerce companies. It was uh, very strict. So uh, if you wanted to do night labor for um, uh, e-commerce deliveries, which is a bit the standard today in the sector, if you want to do next day deliveries, you need to have in most cases overnight picking. But it was very strict arranged in Belgium. It was only limited. You could only do it till midnight or a bit longer. You always needed to have a permission from one of the unions within the company, which made that if you compare it to other countries like the Netherlands and Germany, in Belgium, we only had one or two companies really working during what was called night, but it was more till midnight to do uh, order picking. And uh, that made that Belgium had a kind of economical disadvantage because most important e-commerce players that do uh, overnight picking, like a Bol.com, like a Zalando, they all place their warehouses just over the borders. For example, Maastricht area, Tilburg area, um, in Germany, Düsseldorf area. And that was always a bit... Um, a pity for Belgium, and uh, last couple of weeks they tried to make some changes to that leg legislation, but still uh, it's a very strict legislation. Uh, you are very limited as an e-commerce company what you can do during the night uh, for e-commerce activities, uh, which makes that Belgium is still a bit yeah, lacking behind, and even the changes they did now, it's what we call too little too late. It's uh, most big warehouses are placed now in the Netherlands, in Germany. I cannot imagine that Bol.com or uh, Zalando would start moving warehouses for the Belgian market there. So, uh, but we have a very strict legislation there, and that, that's the main issue, yes. Well, it's interesting um, when you make a comparison with, say, Amazon. I mean, going back many years, Amazon had only a small number of, well, small, a relatively small number of centralized warehouses in the USA. And they did that for sales tax reasons. But then, as the sales tax laws changed, um, and then Amazon adopted the policy of being closer to the consumer, it then moved its warehouses. But that, that taxation issue isn't going to apply across the EU, is it? Oh, um, I've asked a difficult question. Everyone no, 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 asked no, no, no. a tax I, question. It's no, it, it, of course. What, what is what is playing today much more? What I notice in in the EU, what is playing much more is more the the labour costs uh, uh, more than the um, tax legislation. Because of course we have differences in tax in uh, the European Union, but 
the labor costs, which are an important part of your cost in your supply chain, are much more different in, in Europe or that the, there are much more extremes if you compare, for example, some eastern uh, countries or southern countries with, for example, uh, countries like uh, Denmark, Sweden, uh, also Germany. The, the average labor cost in, in Belgium, for example, is, is uh, huge if you, if, you, um, if you look to what part you get uh, net uh, wage versus gross salary. It's um, today rather it's, uh, yeah, it's a bit rude, but uh, it's, it's terrible if you compare it. Um, and of course, that are the main reasons where um, e-commerce players are looking for. Of course, next to the fact, uh, location-wise, connection to highway, it's, um, but it's labor cost, connections to highway, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's playing today more in Europe than, than purely the taxation things. What is playing an important role in taxation, but that's more, let's say, for the headquarters, but that has nothing to do with the logistics activities. What is playing much more um, uh, taxation-wise for the head, that's mainly headquarters. For example, if you look officially the European headquarters or the worldwide headquarters of IKEA, for example, everybody says it's uh, Sweden. No, it's uh, Amsterdam. Just the same like Stellantis, the big car maker, the, 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 the huge group, uh, everybody says it's it's Ameri um, uh, American, uh, Italian, uh, French. If you look to the real, the the, the real taxation headquarters, also Amsterdam. Uh, Amsterdam. So the Netherlands and Ireland have very nice uh, taxation methods, but that's mainly for uh, let's say the headquarters and the financial flows where they get reductions more than the logistics. I feel like I've opened a can of worms right at the end here for us to, to talk about the various tax regimes and the future of these things. Because of course, Amazon comes into that as well yeah. and the various other e-commerce players are headquartered in um, places with very friendly tax regimes, let's put it that way, yes. without, without um, using stronger language. Um, Rule, if people want to find out more about your work and the team at the, uh, in, in your department at the University of Antwerp, where should they go? Uh, they, they can check it out on uh, the, the website from the University of Antwerp and I, I try to also um, sometimes uh, post something on LinkedIn, uh, etc. So feel free to follow me there. Rul Gevaars, Professor in Last Mile Logistics and Supply Chain at the University of Antwerp. Thank you very much for joining us on the Postal Hub podcast today. With pleasure. Coming soon on the Postal Hub podcast, Dr. Letitia de Blanc is going to join us to talk about the impact of lockdowns on urban logistics and the lessons learned. Look out for that one coming very soon. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast platform or on your favorite podcast platform. I really don't care. Just do it. <laughs> subscribe. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and many others. Too numerous to mention. When you're there subscribing, please do leave a rating and a review. It really does help. It's just a little thing. Only take a moment but it helps keep this podcast going and keeps it free for you all and all that sort of stuff uh, please also subscribe to my email newsletter go to thepostalhub.com you can subscribe to my regular email newsletter which comes out about once a week and I have another postal email newsletter postal email newsletter you know what I mean it's called the daily delivery digest sign up for it it's great it does what it says on the tin you can follow me on LinkedIn that's also free all this stuff's free just take it folks um, what else you can email me if you want to contact me about anything all my, at all my email address is ian at thepostalhub.com I'm Ian Kerr thanks for listening in and I look forward to your company next time on the Postal Hub podcast <laughs> <laughs>